I remember it like yesterday when Matt came down the stairs and said so casually with a smile, I booked a one-way ticket to Santiago, Chile. I thought to myself, is this real? Can we really leave our amazing careers, friends, and family? Fast forward 10 months later after all the hard conversations, endless checklists, and heartfelt goodbyes, we were heading to the airport with one backpack each, about to set out for a multi-year adventure around the world. Filled with excitement, we had no idea what to expect, but we knew it would be a fun ride. Join us as we share what we are learning on our journey of a lifetime. This is Passport Joy Travel Talk with Nikki and Matt Javitt. Thank you for tuning in today, wherever you are in the world. We really appreciate it. This is Matt Javitt alongside Nikki Javitt from PassportJoy.com, where we've been traveling the world full time for over 15 months. In this episode, we answer a question we get asked often on the road. Could we have traveled the world in our 20s? And we share our thoughts and feelings on this subject. Also, we dig deep into visa research. This can be a very intimidating process. And Nikki has built a ton of content on this to help us through our process as we go through different countries around the world. As always, you can find the show notes on this episode at PassportJoy.com under the podcast link. And you can find everything from this episode and other episodes that gives you the easy links to find the things that we discuss. Also at PassportJoy.com, you can find our blog posts, tips, travel tools, and our social media links. So go there. And while you're there, sign up for the newsletter. Just put your email address in there and sign up for the newsletter. We send out a weekly newsletter that tells you where we've been the week prior and where we're going next and insight and, and thoughts on the way as we gather them. As you know, the reviews on iTunes are huge and it helps us out a ton. So if you please leave us a review on iTunes or the podcast, if you're enjoying it and you're getting value out of it, we really appreciate it. A recent review came from Indy Mobro that said, this is awesome insight to go along with the already phenomenal pictures and blog posts. Looking forward to what else is in store. Thank you so much for that review, Indy Mobro. We really appreciate it. And we're very thankful for all those that are tuning in each week. And uh, we're enjoying doing this. Uh, yes, it is, is uh, can be quite some work as we travel um, and trying to find spots to record and, and upload and everything. But it's we're finding it's worth it. And we're getting uh, great reviews and, I guess, encouragement from the listeners out there. So thank you for that. As always, hope you enjoy this episode. Have a blast with it and talk soon. All right, this is a question and answer portion. Again, if you have questions, send them in to matt at passportjoy.com. Again, matt at passportjoy.com, and we'll try to get those answered. This was not actually a write-in question, but this is something we get asked quite often, so we wanted to address it as we're on the road. We are, obviously, we're older travelers when it comes to what we're doing. We had careers, and we left, right? So a lot of people when they think about these things, especially in other cultures, when you're talking about Europe and Australia, there's a, the gap year is significant in that culture where typically people will do either after high school, when they're 18, they'll take a gap year or after college, they'll take a gap year and spend six, nine, 12 months on the road traveling. And we've met a lot of these, I'll call them kids. Well, we've met a lot of these kids on the road that do this and they're doing it currently. And so Nikki and I, and, and the, the kids will ask us or other travelers will ask us like, Hey, did you guys do a gap year? what was different, what would you do, what would be different. And so we're going to address that. Like, could we do this, what we're doing, what would it be different when we're 20? How is our experience different? And just the, kind of that thought process and go through that. So I'll let Nikki start. Yeah. So I have actually thought about this question a lot since we've been, you know, asked this question and whatnot. But so the answer to this question would be yes, I definitely could do this at 20 and I could do this at 30 and 40, but it would just look completely different. And I'll tell you why. So in my 20s and in my 30s, I've just thought about travel completely in a different light. And especially now that I've done it in my 20s and in my 30s. In my 20s, I didn't long-term travel. I, I traveled, like I went on spring breaks and I went on extended vacations with my family, even in my teens. And it, you know, I wasn't fortunate enough to go on long-term travel until I was, you know, in my 30s. But I just cared differently about things that I do now versus that I did when I was in my 20s. So for example, like for me now, sleeping is very important to me. 
like if I don't feel good, I don't really necessarily enjoy myself as much. So in my 20s, just winging it was okay. And even winging it every day was okay to me. But now I'm just okay winging it sometimes. So I'd rather get a good night's sleep to enjoy the excursions or the plans that we have set up for the next day, as opposed to like feeling like crap. And I just wouldn't want to do that all the time anymore, you know? And in my twenties, like I really wouldn't care if I felt like crap every day. And I just tell myself, okay, I'm just going to recover and I'll be okay. Or I'll, I'll catch up on my sleep. I'd lie to myself and say, I'd catch up on, you know, on my sleep on the weekends. Another thing is, is, you know, along with that, which kind of goes hand in hand with feeling like crap is drinking alcohol. Like in my twenties, you know, I would tell myself like, okay, I may be too hungover for the next thing the next day, but I'll somehow manage or I'll get through that. But now I'll tell myself, well, I don't want to be hungover tomorrow for my free walking tour. So I'm going to cut myself off at nine or 10 PM and get some good sleep. And I shouldn't have that extra shot of alcohol because I don't want to feel like crap the next day. So that's a little bit different, you know, in my 20s versus my 30s. Another major thing for me is also accommodations. So in my 20s, I may have been okay with putting up with excessive noise or having interrupted sleep just to save some cash. Like, for example, maybe when Matt and I were in our 20s, I would have been okay sleeping in a 12 person dorm room in a hostel to save some cash. But now, you know, for us to save cash, I say, hey, like, I'm cool with sleeping in a private room and I'll have a shared bathroom or let's get a shared Airbnb and stay with a host family to save some cash. And sometimes I'm like, you know what? I don't want to save cash. Like I'll just spend more money. You know, let's stay at a boutique hotel versus let's staying at a Marriott. So that's a little bit different. And another thing is, is, and this is actually super funny to me now that I think about it is the packing thing. So in my twenties, like taking too much versus nailing the art of packing the absolute essentials now in my thirties. So like in my twenties, I was really just still figuring out who I was style wise. And like, like I actually cared what people thought I looked like. I went on a yacht week trip with my sister and my brother-in-law. And I honestly brought two pairs of heels, a pair of wedges. I can't even begin to tell you how many dresses I brought. And I never wore like any of that stuff. And I remember going home and like telling Matt, like, oh my gosh, look at all this stuff that I brought and I didn't even wear it. And he looked at me like, I mean, I told you so, you know? And now I just think that's so hilarious that I even did that. And now it's like, all I really care about is like bringing the basic essentials, picking out a color scheme that I can mix and match. And I care about looking classy and, and I really don't care what people think that I look like, or if I wear the same thing over and over again, I more so just go for the comfort and like, I don't want my feet to have blisters if I'm wearing shoes. So that's another major like difference for me versus my twenties and thirties. Another thing is making friends. So when I was in my twenties, I can tell you that I cared a lot about like befriending everyone and knowing everyone's life story. And I wanted to go on all these crazy adventures and I would do just things that I didn't even want to do because I really wanted to just be everybody's friends. And I was in college and I cliff dove off of a cliff into water that I swore that there were rocks below, but everyone's like, no, no, you're fine. You're fine. And I can't even believe that I did that crazy stuff. Or I remember, you know, going out to bars at night and not even wanting to drink. And I was just like, oh, I'm so tired. I just want to go home. And people would be like, come on, just take another shot, you know? And it's like, I wouldn't even do that now. I just don't do things anymore that I don't want to do. And if I'm tired, I'm just like, hey guys, I'm going to go home. And I know that people will respect that. So it's like, those things are completely different. Now, you know, Matt and I, if we see a person out and, you know, they give you a smile or you think that they look like a semi-normal person or they glance over at you and you're sitting in a restaurant or bar and you strike up a conversation with that person and you befriend that person, it just kind of happens. So I'm not worried about if it does or not. I don't really like stress out over it. Yeah. And, and the reality is, is making friends. I mean, think about it. If, if you're listening to this and you're in your thirties or forties, it's, it's not as easy to make friends later in life. If it's not associated with like your kids or work or um, some of the avenue, you just don't have that many opportunities to make friends, especially as, as a couple traveling. It's 
really not as easy as I thought I, it would be. Um, when we left 15 months ago, I thought we would have an opportunity to make a lot of, a lot of new friends on the road. And we have, we've had an opportunity to, to build some new relationships that are, we're going to take for the rest of our lives. But I thought we'd come in contact with more people than we, we have. And that's why we do things like uh, meetups and, and work aways and, and uh, get a chance to, to meet new people because it's, if you're forced into those environments and you're absolutely going to build friendships that way. But um, when we go out, we're not, we're not approachable at all because um, how often do you approach another couple? It's just, it's just awkward. So we don't get that many opportunities, but when you're a kid, when you're like, uh, when I say a kid, when you're 22 or, or 20 and you're traveling and you're either you're traveling single or you're traveling with a couple, people know that you're out to hang out and meet new people and party and see new people. So it's just different in that way. I do still snorkel. I do still cliff dive. I still do some of these things that Nikki just said she doesn't do. She's very adventurous. Don't let her fool you. She does do a lot of these wilder things, but a lot of times she'll just watch me do the the crazier stuff. But when it comes to the adventure aspect of it, I absolutely agree with her. I can't imagine doing it in my 20s because I was uh, much crazier. Um, Not that I was stupid crazy, but I was just a, a lot more adventurous in my early 20s than I am today. But I, I'm I'm thankful that we are uh, that I'm taking this journey now rather than because I know that I appreciate it much more today than I would have then. And I'm getting a lot more out of it because the contacts that were getting to me on the road are much more valuable to me because in my early 20s I probably would have talked about sports and some of the things that I was involved with because I obviously I play college hoops so I'd have been I'd have been talking about mostly those generic conversations. But now when we have a chance to meet people, we can get in depth and talk about whether it's our career paths or uh, the opportunities I had talked about cryptocurrency. And then you could talk, you can have faith conversations or um, even though we attempt to avoid it, political conversations come up as well. We have some life experience to, to give a, a viewpoint on some of that stuff. So the conversations and things and, and the relationships and, and opportunities we have at this later stage in life has made it, I guess, more authentic when we're, we're doing those things and not like like 30 minute combos because we're taking shots with other friends elsewhere. And I don't want to paint a picture of just like single young gap year travelers as these party and people, because we've met a lot of adventure seeking travelers out there that are at, their, at this age that they, they're not partiers. They're, they're doing it to see culture and see the world. Um, I'm probably just classifying it that way because maybe that's probably how I would have done it uneducated way. But um, there's been a lot of opportunities for us and to do us all let Nikki continue on. Yeah. And to piggyback off the partying thing, like surprisingly so, we still love a good party. And even though I said I love my sleep because I do and I love, you know, being refreshed the next day to do my activities, we will stay up late until the early morning if there's a concert or there's an event that warrants this. But like I said, with that being said, you know, it definitely takes me longer now to recover from that the next day. But like I said, you can always sleep in later or, you know, figure it out. So we do still go to parties. We do still go to pubs. We go out, we hang out. If we're invited to something, I'm not going to be some snore bore and not do it because I'm like, oh no, I'm in my 30, I'm in my mid thirties now, or I should probably say late thirties now, but I'm in my late thirties now and I'm not going to do this because I need my rest to go do my free walking tour. I mean, that's not how I am, but what I'm just trying to do is essentially paint the picture of is that in my twenties, it would have been different as opposed to what it is now. And I am still adventurous. It's just the adventure that I did in my twenties. I did, I I made a lot more stupid decisions. And now I just think of, well, this would be the consequence. And no, I don't want to risk breaking my body as before I was like, eh, screw it. Okay. Maybe I'll, that won't happen. And now I'm like, no, I don't want it to happen. I don't want a broken arm. So that's just the difference on that one. Another thing is, is that I wanted to touch on too, is uh, like sightseeing. So, and we recently just talked about this in our, our last podcast, but doing all the things like all the things in my twenties, I think would have been what I would have tried to strive for. So like hitting everything on a checklist, like I need to see this site and I need to see this based on whatever someone's all-inclusive list was to do, as opposed to right now, like I just do what I feel like should be tailored to me. So I don't feel the pressure to have this like itinerary or this 
checklist to check off. It's like, what is my bucket list? What does Nikki and Matt want to do? And I don't feel like I need to rush through it. And I really enjoy the moment and I really seize the moments. And I feel like in my twenties, I I really didn't do that. It was kind of like, here's these top 10 things to do. I need to do them and I have to do it on this day and then move on to the next. So that probably would have been a little bit different. And now the thing I really do enjoy is I feel like I'm more relaxed and I feel like I'm more spontaneous now as opposed to before. Another thing too for me is food. Food before, and this is so gross, but food before was for me like in my 20s, like I probably would have said, okay, I'm gonna get this bag of baked Lay's and eat this can or drink this can of Diet Coke. And I'd be like, okay, cool. Like that was my lunch. And then I can try to move on with my day. But now I feel I really have the ability to enjoy good food and ingredients because I know more about food and I really care about like what I put in my body. So, and in visiting all these great countries, I have so many options and I'm really enjoying like eating around the world and like having the ability to do that. So that's another difference, I think, between, you know, 20s versus 30s for me. And then destinations in general. So in my 20s, for me personally, all I really cared about was like fun in the sun, like what beach vacation can I go to next? And I was so obsessed with like, I think I I legitimately went to Miami three times. I was like, I want to go to Miami and then going to Mexico and Jamaica and the Caribbean. And I was like, what all inclusive resort can I go to? What's the hottest spot? And, you know, and that's all I really cared about was like, what package deal can I get? And like basically getting the most bang for my buck. And now I really truly care about like having the most authentic cultural experience and, you know, getting off the beaten path and getting a little bit dirty and, you know, immersing myself amongst the locals. And I don't really care if I go to places where no one speaks English, but before that really would have intimidated me. So I guess like to answer that question, it's just like very stark contrast between 20s versus 30s. And it's just a hard question to answer because it's really all hypotheticals and I'm kind of like looking backwards, but I do know myself well and I do know how I did think. So, and I did go on quite some, uh, quite a few, you know, vacations and, and trips and whatever. And that is really how I thought. And so I feel like my mindset is drastically changed and this is how I think now. So, so in my 20s, I probably at one point, I, I forgot count. I, I think I went to Las Vegas 12 or 14 times in my mid twenties, which looking back, is just crazy. And, and that was before, that was before I moved there for 14 months. So yeah, total waste of money, no culture really, but I learned how to play a lot of good poker, <laughs> but, uh, and I learned, I learned how to gamble. So it's totally, I'm totally a different person now. I went through a, a lot of different career path changes that helped me become who I am today. And it's, it's helped me a ton to understand what I'm trying to get out of travel. Cause that's really important too, is like, what are you trying to get out of it? And, and, um, the reflective periods that you have, because there's space and days where you get a chance to think about all the things you're seeing and the people that you're meeting and, and the change you can bring back with you when you do go back to the States and stuff like that. So that's what I'm um, really enjoying in this process. But I, and, and we're so lucky because in my early twenties, the, a lot of the opportunities out there were, didn't even exist. When you think about like Airbnb and and the technologies that are out here that we get to take advantage of, not Uber and the flight tech, the technology with finding cheap flights and buses and all this stuff is, I mean, it's going to get better and better and better. But right now is the best time ever to travel. And it's safe. Um, I know the media doesn't want to tell you that, but it's as safe as it's ever been in the world. And you, you can pick and choose which destinations you you don't want to go to if, if you're nervous about certain locations, but it's absolutely the safest time to travel and the technology is the best. So we're lucky in our timing of this and, and how this all came together for us. But I'm just kind of answering that question that we've get asked. If I was in my twenties or if I had a child that was getting close to the gap year age and it was a consideration, absolutely. Absolutely. I would encourage it because I think the mindset that you can come back with, whether it's two weeks, two months or two years of travel, it it changes your life. It gives you all those trips that Nikki and I took prior to making our decision, changed how I saw the world, changed how I thought about things and, and, and put me in a different path of life that 
even at age 20, it'll change you and it, it'll help you uh, in so many ways. So I would encourage that. Or if you're a 20 year old thinking about this decision, absolutely. And if you're in somebody like that's in our situation where you have some savings built up and you're, you're thinking about taking that risk of, of pulling a trigger and doing it, there's risks. There's always risks because of, of jobs and stuff like that when you come back. But the upside is so up, it's so high that uh, it, it'd be a great decision for you if you wanted to do it. And um, you're going to get so much out of it, not dependent upon the, the amount of time you want to take, whether it's, we've got a friend that's doing um, four, three or four months off of her job. And, or if you're looking for nine, 12 months off or, or a couple of years, you're going to get a lot of value out of it and you, you might change your life for the better in some way. So, so definitely um, we are obviously 15 months into our journey we're advocates of it. And I think I can say it in, in my age. I think that what we're doing is going to become more common. I really do. I think this mid career gap period is going to become more common because of the things that we highlighted. The travel is getting easier and it's getting safer. And it's a way um, to look at different um, career options if you're in that gap. And um, I think that people are going to continue to do it more and more uh, as we turn on. So that's it. Thanks for that. That's nobody wrote that in or anything, but that's a question we get all the time. And again, if you have questions, please send them in to Matt at PassportJoy.com and we will get those answered. Thank you. I found a coffee and tea that I absolutely love. Birch Boys Chaga Coffee and Tea is based out of upstate New York. Now, let me attempt to get scientific on you for a minute. Chaga, that's spelled C-H-A-G-A, is a super mushroom that has one of the highest antioxidant concentrations among any food in the world. It's a superfood. It grows on live birch trees in semi-Arctic climates, which is why the Adirondack Mountains are Chaga's perfect habitat. Rich in antioxidants, vitamins, and nutrients, it is no mystery that Chaga has been dubbed the mushroom of immortality by the health community. I love this coffee and tea so much that I had it shipped to me while traveling and I carried it in my bag so I can make it on the road as a substitute for times when I'm not drinking the local brands that I attempt to try. The young team behind the product is wonderful and their vision to make Traga a household name is a powerful one. Uh, I found these guys when I was doing some research on startup companies and they are full of energy and they have a great vision and they really want to make this coffee a national success and I, I, I believe in them. You can check out their products at PassportJoy.com forward slash coffee. Again, forward slash coffee. Uh, and I'm confident you'll love this product and want to try it on your own. They always have deals out there to get it cheaper. And not only coffee and tea, they also have soap and some other products. So check that out and I'm sure you'll love it. Moosejaw.com is an online and brick and mortar retailer specializing in outdoor recreation apparel and gear for snowboarding, rock climbing, hiking, and camping. They sell name brands such as North Face, Patagonia, Merrill, Prana, Marma, and many more. It's actually how I purchased my Patagonia Nano Puff jacket for all of the hiking adventures that we've gone on during our travels. They have free two-day shipping on any of the orders that you purchase that are over $49. And don't forget to sign up for the Moose Jaw Rewards program to earn an additional 10% cash back on every regular non-sale purchase that you can order. It's totally free to sign up and you can use your reward cash for future purposes. To get more details and discounts on your travel gear, simply go to PassportJoy.com forward slash moose. Again, PassportJoy.com forward slash moose to purchase your future travel gear. Thanks. We're going to talk about the visa process. This is a big part of travel and understanding what you have to do in order to be legal in the places that you're traveling to. Nikki handles all of this for us, for our relationship and in all of our travel. She handles all this. It actually popped up and it's something that we wanted to stress because it popped up when we were in Saigon, also known as Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. My buddy was visiting us from the Philippines. And this was his first trip out of the U.S. as it pertained to not Mexico, I, and I think the Caribbean. I'm, I'm throwing my buddy under the bus a little bit here. My buddy Ryan, he, does, he doesn't mind though. But when he reached out to me, he said, we were going over flights and all this stuff. And I said, do you have your visa? And he's like, what do you mean? What visa? And I said, buddy, if you're coming to Vietnam, you got to have your visa lined up. You, you need a 30-day visa and you can't get it at the airport. 
because a lot of countries you visit, Nick, you'll go through that. You can get it at the airport. But I said, no, Vietnam, you have to get it before you arrive. And it's an electronic process. It takes three to four days, depending. So you need to do this. And he was like, oh my God, um, let me jump on it. And it was this is a week before he was meeting us. So he got it. He absolutely, he got it, as did his uh, friend that he was traveling with. So they locked that out. And But it, it reminded me that these are things that we take for granted because we've been traveling for so long, but it might not be something that people that don't travel as much as we have or do um, think of all the time. So we wanted to address it. And it's a question that we get a lot asked a lot. So Nikki is going to handle this and go from it. Yeah. So prior to going to any country that I know we're going to visit, I use this website and it's the U.S. Department of State's website. And Matt can put that link in the show note. I'm not going to ramble it off, but it's essentially travel.state.gov. And it, there's a whole bunch of stuff at the end of it, but it is the U.S. Department of State's website. And there's several countries where, like Matt had said, that do not require, even though you need a visa, it's kind of confusing that you can get a visa. It's called a visa upon arrival. So a tourist visa upon arrival, which essentially means that when you fly into the country, you just show them your passport and they will simply stamp a stamp in on one of the pages of your passport, provided that it meets certain requirements. And I'll go over that. But they will write on that stamp, you know, the date that you arrive and then however long that country allows you to stay, whether it's 30 days or 90 days or however long it is, they'll write the date that, you know, that you have to leave by essentially. And that's a visa that you can get upon arrival. Then there's very few countries, which is the strictest of strict. And I'm, I'm not going to ramble off a list of them, but there's very few countries that require that you either arrive in person at an embassy of that country. And they have embassies that are located around the world and actually hand in your passport so they can then put a sticker in your passport that is their their visa, or you have to then, the next level of that would be mail in your physical passport. So say I live in the United States, I mail in my passport from my home, I mail it into the China embassy, and then they mail me back my passport with the affixed visa and however long that visa lasts, and then, then I'm good to go. And then the other type of visa that you can obtain is, like Matt had said, is Vietnam is one of the countries that allows this, is, is an e-visa. And those are really awesome. And I love those because you can go online and it's essentially an electronic, which is the E, visa. And you go online, you upload your photo, you upload your information, you answer some questions on their questionnaire, and then they will email you your visa and you have to print out the paper copy and you bring it along with you. And when you go to customs, when you land in the country, you show them that paper copy of that electronic visa along with your passport. And then you are allowed to stay there for a certain amount of time. So those are essentially the three types of visa. And then the non-visa would be that you can just go to a certain area or a certain country and you don't need a visa, but you can stay there for a certain amount of time. So when you get there, you show your passport, they enter in your information from your passport into their, their electronic system. So they take your passport physically from you and they enter in your biographical information. They log in the date that you enter. They don't stamp or they do stamp your passport because I've had both happen. Then they know that you've arrived on X date and they know that you have to leave on X date. And then you can just be free to go about and do what you need to do. And, and you don't have a visa. So it's kind of just like you don't need one. So those are like the four situations. But anyways, I always look on the U.S. Department of State's website and see the requirements that are needed. If I need a visa, if I don't need a visa, if I know to need to go online or if I need to actually go to an embassy, because we, you know, for our situation, since we are not in the United States, we do not want to have to give our passport up because it's pertinent that we always have our passport on our bodies. But just when you go to this website and you visit it, it has so much information and it's really good information. And I love it because it's all in one area. It's in a great way to find it too. So they have these little tabs that you can click on. And the first tab is called a quick facts tab. And it tells you basically like the passport validity, like how long your passport has to be valid for in order for you to actually be able to get into the country, how many blank pages are needed in your passport. They tell you, do you need a tourist visa? Is it required? Do you not need one? It tells you what vaccinations you need to enter the country. 
And then it tells you their currency restrictions, like how much money you can come into the country with cash money on you and how much money that you can leave the country with cash money on your physical body. And then they also have a tab that's called embassy and consulates. And it tells you where those embassy and consulates are located within the country. And this is really important just in case anything happens. So you know, once you are in that country, where to find help if help is needed. There's another tab on there, which I often visit and it's reliable information. It's called destination description. And it's just a quick fact sheet about the place that you're going to. And I really like it. And it's a government-based fact sheet about the location. And then there's the entry, exit, and visa requirements. And this is the most pertinent tab that I go to. It's the first tab I actually look at. This is where you will find how to apply for a visa if it's actually needed. And this is where you will find if you can actually apply for an e-visa. So the electronic visas that I I was talking about. Um, it also goes over information. So like if you need like a valid passport and an onward return ticket, and this is really important because some places, even though you have that visa, you're good to go. You have the correct amount of blank pages in your passport. Your passport's valid for, you know, six months past the date and you're, you know, you have everything. But now some countries require that you have a onward or return ticket. So meaning, say you're going to go to Vietnam and they say that you have to have an onward or return ticket. Well, that means you have to have a plane ticket or a ferry ticket or a bus ticket. You have to have something that says that you are leaving that country within the X amount of time that your visa will expire out of their country. So make sure you check that. And then also it will be like, there'll be a section within that section that'll say like stipulations of working. So if you're going there to work, it'll tell you like if this is a country where you can do that or volunteer. So they have those kind of rules within that tab as well. Build on that. The flight out is a big deal. We almost got caught with this going into South Africa. We were actually held at the gate and we almost did not get a chance to go into South Africa because we could not show them our flight out because we were staying in South Africa for three months, um, which is perfectly legal, but we didn't book our flight out yet because we didn't know where we were going at that point. We were trying to stay flexible. We didn't know if we we're going to go up to Kenya, if we we're going to go to Europe, if we we're going to go to, we ended up going to Bangkok. We didn't know where we were going to go. So we hadn't booked it yet, but luckily the airline guy, they let us through it was a situation where we, we kind of had to beg and plea a little bit. We showed him our extended stay and we told him our story and he ended up letting us go through. And we also, when we came into from Moscow into Munich and we were going through the our initial entry into Europe, uh, into the Schengen, the gentlemen at, in Munich were extremely tough where you had to show where you're staying, your next visit, your next flight out. We had to go through every bit and piece of that. And the piece, there was a couple of people in front of us that didn't have their information organized and they were asked to step to the side to get additional questioning to go through. So take that really serious because it's real. If you don't have your information lined up and when you, and I know Nick's going to get into this, but having this stuff in a shared area, whereas Google docs, whatever you use to share your information with yourself, but be able to pull it up quickly. And remember, you might not have Wi-Fi when you land. So you might not be in a situation where you can connect right away as you're going through customs because sometimes when you land, you're in an airport and then they're walking to the customs. You don't have a chance to really adjust. So you want to have all this stuff in a good place, whether it's printed out or if it's in a, an easy spot on your phone, it's downloaded on your phone and you don't have to get on Wi-Fi. Those are things you, you need to remember. Yeah, what I personally do, because I do not have a phone plan is, is I will take a photo of my information. So it's a screenshot of the information because I don't have access to Wi-Fi. So if let's say Matt's phone dies and that doesn't work and I don't have access to online, like how would I show anyone my Airbnb address? or my onward ticket, there'd be no way. So I take a photo of it or a screenshot of it. So then it's in my photos and I can just easily pull that up at customs. So moving on. So after that tab where you can find out how to apply for a visa, if an e-visa is, is possible, if you can or cannot work or volunteer, because that's important. Like we do work away. So I, I check that out. The next tab on this website is safety and security. And I just like to look at this just because this is the U.S. government reporting what they have found to be the most reported crimes in that country. And you can choose to look at this 
or take this and be live in fear of it or take it with a grain of salt. But I, I just like to be aware of it. So it'll just tell you like the crimes in the country at that time. And I'm just going to tell you this flat out nine times out of 10, it is beware of pickpocketing like ATM scams and things like that. It's really nothing like huge. Like there's nothing like sexual assaults or anything like that. I mean, there are a couple places that we have gone to where it has said that, but it, nine times out of 10, I'm telling you, it's like beware of pickpocketing and watch out for ATM scams. So I just wanted to let you know that that is there. So if you're going to a country and you want to check that out, that is a tab. And I just think it's awesome that they put that on there. The next section is local laws and special circumstances. This is by far, hands down, a must look at. And what this is, is essentially like laws that you have to abide by. And I don't know if people even know this is like out there or like that you have to do these things, but we've heard so many stories of locals that tell this. And and I'll let Matt tell this story because he just learned this at a meetup that we went to. But in this section, it will tell you if you have to carry your U.S. passport on you at all times or not. So in certain countries, you have to have your U.S. passport on you at all times. Or in other countries, you can, it'll say, keep your passport in a hotel safe and keep a paper copy and a digital copy on you at all times. Because in certain countries, they're known for high theft of passports. So they're not going to tell you to carry your passport on you. But Matt was recently at a meetup and this guy was telling him a story about a gentleman who did not have a passport on him and do you want to tell a story? Yeah, or? yeah, at the high level, it was essentially this guy put himself in a bad scenario where I think he was he was purchasing tickets to the opera. The, the story was in Prague. So um, he was he was going to the opera or something, but I think he was trying to get a student ticket. So he was trying to get over on the system. But what ended up happening was they said, okay, can you show us some ID that you deserve this discounted rate? And he, and he pulled out a paper copy of his passport. And they were like, no, we need to see your actual passport. And he's like, well, I don't have one. And they said, well, that's a problem. And then, so then the police came on this guy. So essentially he got arrested and that's the- for not having his passport on him because that is the law in that country. And one step further what I, that I learned in, in that conversation was having a paper copy of your passport is actually illegal because you're not supposed to be copying paper passports. Off the record, I guess, this is on the record, but off the record, I carry a paper passport with me everywhere. Now that that means because it just, it, to me, it makes the most sense. I don't always carry my actual passport. We've kind of changed. We're now keeping a closer eye based on hearing this story and, and this education that we're, we're carrying our, our actual passport more if we think it makes sense. And as Nikki ch- keeps an eye on the place that we're supposed to do that, and we'll continue to do that. But always I would suggest, and obviously keep get an electric copy. I think Nikki touched on that already. Make your own electronic copy so somebody has it back home uh, as well. I know both. I think both of our parents have a copy of ours, so if we need it. Yeah, but just just so you're not in that situation, because in this section on this website, it specifically says that you could be arrested if stopped by a police officer and you don't have it. So anyways, just FYI. In this section, it also talks about just other laws like work laws, faith-based laws, women traveler laws, and pet laws. I don't know if you're bringing your pet on your travels, it's a good law to look at. There's another tab on this also for medical, and it's a really good section to know as well. And it's just near and dear to my heart. So it'll go over the country's laws on health insurance, if they accept health insurance or not, or if cash is required. It goes over prescription prescription laws as well. And that's really important. So if you're traveling with prescriptions, you can actually click on some links. It'll take you to a different website and you can see if the prescriptions that you're traveling with are illegal or legal. There are a lot of places where if you're traveling with painkillers or if you're traveling with like ADD medications, they're completely illegal unless you write the government's website beforehand and ask for special permission and bring a doctor's note. If you get stopped, not while you're out and walking about, I'm not talking about that, but if you get stopped in your, um, at the airport and their TSA checks your bags and you have those on you and you have not asked for special permission and you get caught with narcotics 
on you, you will go to jail. I mean, it's no quite, you see it in the news all the time. I know you tell yourself it's not going to happen to me. Oh, well, I have a prescription, but you will get thrown in jail. I mean, it's, it's no joke. Um, it also goes over vaccination information, um, and lists the diseases in the section that you are most at risk for. Now, with that being said, I'm only mentioning that because this is like a one-stop shop, this, this website, the U S department of state, I don't particularly use this section, this medical section for that. I go to the CDC's website to check for all my travel vaccination information. And I do cross-reference it sometimes just so I can double check it. But um, for vaccine information, I use CDC's website. But this is all encompassing and it has like pretty much everything. So if you don't want to have to go to two different websites, it is listed here. And then the last section that I thought is kind of interesting is travel and transportation section. So it goes over their traffic laws and it does inform you that if you do have an international driver's license, which I do have mine, but it will tell you here in this section if it's accepted or not. Although if you do have an international driver's license within that little booklet that they give you, it tells you anyways in there. So, but again, if you just want to go to this website, it's like a one-stop shop. You can find all this information out. So just really important. Check out this website. I check it out well before I know when we're going to a place like, do I need a visa? Do I not need a visa? Because sometimes even when you apply for these online e-visas, like the Vietnam one we applied for was three days. Matt's took three days, but mine took six days for some reason. And we did it on the exact same day, like 20 minutes apart. So you never know really how long they're going to take. So even though they'll say it just takes, you know, 24 to 72 hours, but other countries may take longer. So But yeah, it's just a good section or a good website to go to. And it has tons of information. Great. And like Nikki just touched on it, the idea that do this, if you're planning a trip three, four or five months out, do it as soon as possible. But I would recommend that you keep an eye on it and make a monthly calendar event that makes you look at it as you're getting closer because it changes. The laws change, how they do it changes. Like they, this, the electronic is really picking up around uh, the world where a lot of countries are doing electronic visa. So those change all the time. So that you might get an opportunity to do an electronic visa or they might just change the entire process. So you're gonna wanna keep an eye on that. And uh, we found that on Twitter, a lot of these US embassies now have their own Twitter page that spit out information. So if you know you're going to a certain city, you can just follow them on Twitter or look at them. Uh, if you're not on Twitter, just put in a note to go look at them once a month or so and just kind of follow what's going on on Twitter. Because a lot of times they'll put out if there's civil unrest because of political matters, if there's something going on in the city, you can get a good pulse from the Twitter on that as well. And then I guess to, to wrap it up, they don't know how many, but the, the, the most recent stat looks like there's about 40% of Americans that actually have a passport. Just get your passport. If, if you don't have anything scheduled to get you out of the country in the next year or two, I would still just go get it because you never know when that awesome trip's going to pop up. Or if you see a deal come through a, a website and you're like, oh my God, we've always dreamed of going to Paris or London or Barcelona. And there's this trip that takes us there for $200. We got to do it. And you don't have your passport. You're not going to do it because you're thinking, well, I got to get my passport. And this is going to be impossible. If you have your passport ready and it's, you got everything situated to travel overseas or wherever that might take you, it's going to make your yes a whole lot easier. So I just really encourage you to have your passport and get it ready and just get that part of the process out of the way. And then the, the visa stuff will follow. So that's it. I uh, hope you enjoyed this, this educational process. We'll have all this information in the show notes. So you can just click on over and see where this stuff is out there. But um, thanks for listening. All right. Thank you so much for listening to that episode. We really hope you enjoyed it. Go to PassportJoy.com under the podcast tab to find the show notes from this episode and all the other segments that we have. And those give you the links to the information that was the most important. And while you're there, sign up for the weekly newsletter. Just put your email address in there, get the weekly newsletter, and that gives you the latest updates on where we are now and where we're headed to next week. And then you, you ride along with us as we go. 
All right. I'm hoping you are looking forward to your next journey ahead. Hopefully you got a, a summer vacation, a weekend planned, a tweet getaway, something out there that you're looking forward to. And we're really excited about it. You can send that information over to us. We, we'd love to hear those stories. We get emails from friends all the time and saying, hey, we're going here. What do you think? Send those over. We really appreciate it. Matt at PassportJoy.com. We're on any of the social webs and we, we love hearing that stuff. Safe travels. Make it a great journey. Bum 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 b